Hi, Kinesiology 4120. Welcome to our lecture on tests and assessments. So this plays off of our previous lecture on needs analysis. Um, so we determine you know, the general properties of what we think our athletes need or what are the demands of the sport. And now we need to understand where our athletes are on that spectrum of, of how prepared they are for their sport. So going back to our needs analysis, these are kind of the, the boxes we need to check when it comes to preparing our athletes. So what are their energy system demands? What are the strength demands, power demands, speed demands, mobility and flexibility demands, movement pattern demands, planes of motion, their body composition. And then now we're kind of tailoring now a little bit more towards the individual. So we know that the sport and the position require certain demands and, and have certain elements of successful performers. However, once we get down to the individual, we have to be able to understand, does my athlete fit this model that I've created for a need? Um, do they have all of these components or are they very good on the metabolic demands? However, they're slow or they lack the mobility or flexibility required. Um, Maybe there's an issue with their body composition, but they're strong enough and fast enough. This, we don't know this until we look at our individual athletes and we have to assess them. Okay, we have to perform um, individual assessments based on our needs. So these are tests to determine if we are meeting the requirements for our sport or the demands for our sport. So let's go a little bit more in depth and we'll come back. Okay, when we are first developing a test or administering a test to an athlete, we have to plan it ahead and prepare before they get there. We have to be ready for that athlete to come in. Okay, we're prepared, we have everything ready. Um, now we have to record what goes on. Okay, this, I can't stress this enough. If you are testing, even if it's one client, if it's 30 athletes, record absolutely everything. I like to say paper never forgets. Um, so write it down because you will forget every single time. Um, create some standard protocols so that your consistent test is to test. This improves the reliability of your test. So we know that if we test them in the fall, then we test those same athletes again in the winter. If we have consistent protocols, we can compare those two tests to see if they have improved on what we were trying to train them within. Um, and then when you're working with your athletes, give clear instructions and set expectations at the start. Um, tell them what to do, tell them how to do it, tell them the intensity that you want them to move, um, and give them very clear, concise instructions. Don't overwhelm them, but make sure it's clear. And lastly, um, if you're going, if you aren't going to post-test, don't even pre-test. Uh, there's no point in giving an, in, an initial test if you're never going to test that athlete again. You're never going to have something to compare them to. Um, so we perform tests in order to make comparisons. Um, find objective data and make comparisons. If you are going to pretest, you need to post-test. So you need to understand that there will be a change. Um, if you just do a test at the beginning of the year, every year, that is still a post-test from the previous year. Uh, so make sure that you're always performing some kind of um, final assessment if you're going to do a previous assessment. All right, let's get into the assessments. So first we'll start with our metabolic demands. Aerobic power assessments, we could use something like a VO2 max test on a treadmill, but if you're not working with elite endurance running or cycling athletes or maybe swimming athletes, this is probably not what you're going to use. You're likely going to use some kind of field assessment. So you can use the a 12 minute run test and you'd measure how far the athlete goes. You do a one or a one and a half mile run assessment or the beep test. These are some maximal aerobic assessments. You did the beep test um, as part of your um, aerobic power assessment for your lab. Um, so you understand what that feels like. Um, if we're working with sports that have um, change of direction, I like to use the beep test rather than a one mile run. Um, why? Because in your sport, the demands of the sport is to run hard, stop and go in different directions. 
the beep test aligns more to the demands of the sport <coughs> for uh, things like soccer, tennis, uh, uh, change of direction style sports, uh, basketball, other than the one mile run where it's a continuous effort. Um, I likely won't use that assessment for most of my athletes. Uh, if we're looking at submaximal tests, I would use these more often in injured athletes or in um, individual clients. Uh, so you can use the one mile walk assessment. So you have an athlete who has a separated shoulder and they're not able to run yet, uh, but you still wanna get an understanding of where they are on their aerobic fitness. Uh, you can use the one mile walk assessment or a cycle ergometer where they're, they're on the cycle um, and you can understand or get an assessment of, of their aerobic power using a submaximal test. If you're looking for a lactate threshold, um, you will need some higher level uh, testing equipment um, and you'll be able to perform this on, a, on either a cycle or a, a treadmill um, doing an incremental exercise test while taking blood lactate levels. Um, so this is a little bit more complex uh, when it comes to testing and it takes a little bit more uh, compared to what you would likely have available to you. Uh, but if you're working with elite individuals, you may have access to this kind of equipment. When it comes to anaerobic power tests, we use um, the Wingate is kind of our gold standard. It's a 30 second all out cycle using a percentage of your body weight as the resistance on the cycle. Um, if any of you have done this, you know that it is um, incre or extremely difficult um, and painful. Um, I've done it multiple times. Um, but it does give you an indication of your maximal anaerobic output as well as your ability to maintain it over a 30 second period. Um, one that is a little bit more um, cost effective is the Margarita Kalman test where you use a three-step test where you have an athlete go a four meter run up, go up, 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 alternating um, steps, alternating and, and skipping a step. You measure how high that last step is and you can calculate based on their body weight, gravity, the distance moved um, vertically and the time it took, we can understand what's their power in watts. Um, and it, this is a little bit more inexpensive compared to the Wingate. You do have to have a cycle ergometer. Um, it's best if you have um, all of the equipment available to you. Um, so likely if you're not working with elite athletes, you'll probably use something like a Margarita Kalman test to assess your anaerobic power. Next, we'll move into strength. Um, strength is uh, more complex than it seems. Um, we need to understand what factors influence strength. First one is movement complexity or the number of joints involved. Um, your strength is determined by the joints that you move, the leverages at the joints, as well as the amount of muscle that is available to that joint. Um, so thinking back to our biomechanics section, we have to understand your leverages. We have to understand the range of motion, uh, the postural position, the muscle action involved. We have to understand what type of or what component of force we're looking at. Are we looking at peak force or maximum force output or how fast that force can be developed? Um, so how much force you can produce in a quarter of a second, half a second. We have to look at movement velocity because that will influence your strength as well as your inclusion of the stretch shortening cycle. Um, so we'll spend a little bit more time in lab looking at each of these and understanding them. Uh, but the stretch shortening cycle is the last one. Are you um, going to use it or not use it? That's a big question you have to ask when it comes to your strength assessments. Uh, are you going to allow the athlete to use the stretch shortening cycle? If you do in the pretest, you need to in the post test. Uh, make sure that your range of motion is standardized within athletes um, so that you're able to compare them. Uh, make sure that postural position is, is cued and as well uh, if you have errors in postural position, it is going to limit strength. Um, so if you're trying to test one repetition maximum squat strength, but you have an athlete that is unable to maintain postural position, that is going to be the limiter, not their lower extremity strength. Um, they're, if they're 
erectors, their, their spinal erector strength is too limited and their abdominal strength is too limited to maintain posture, that is going to be their limit. You're not going to actually get a one repetition maximum for their lower extremity. So we'll go into some examples of that in our lab. Um, for strength assessments, one repetition maximum is our best indicator of maximal strength um, from a, a movement pattern standpoint. So within one exact exercise, how strong are you? We could also uh, take that number and we can extrapolate to uh, your ability to perform multiple reps. Uh, so you can perform something like a five repetition maximum. So the most resistance you can move for five repetitions in new athletes and uh, less experienced athletes and really non barbell sport athletes. I'll use something like a three repetition maximum for most of my athletes because um, it is slightly safer because the percentage of their maximum is a little bit lower. Um, it's around 93% of their maximum rather than 100. Um, so that gives me some room for error. So if they perform one repetition and then they go for a second and they miss their second repetition, I know, okay, I've already gotten a one repetition maximum. Or if they're able to perform one repetition, a second repetition, but they can't perform the third, I've calculated a two repetition maximum um, without having to overstress my athletes. Um, and we still get a little bit more of a training response because there is a little bit more volume involved in a multiple repetition max compared to a one. Um, we could also look at things like isometric force. So if we have um, the availability of things like a force plate, uh, we can look at isometric strength, which is strength very specific to the range of motion used or the position of the joint. So if we want to know how strong they are at their weakest point or how strong they are at their strongest point, an isometric force test might be um, best for that number or to get that objective measure. But you do need a force plate or a force transducer to understand it or to measure it. Um, so it's, it's less likely you'll use that in the real world. Um, same with isokinetic testing, um, which controls um, joint speed. So the speed at which uh, the limb is moving and measures how force, how much force you're producing at that speed at that joint. Uh, these are expensive pieces of equipment. Uh, so you're likely not going to use these unless you're in a rehabilitation setting. Then we have things like strength endurance assessment. So football, um, American football is a strength endurance sport. Uh, you need to be able to produce force for longer periods of time as well as repeat it. So they use the bench press to failure test in the NFL combine. Uh, so they take 225 pounds and, uh, and look at how many times you could perform a bench press using that weight. So that's using a constant resistance and measuring your ability to um, perform that movement over extended periods of time. You can also do this as a percentage of one, one RM. So say 80% of your one RM, how many repetitions can you perform? Or a percent of your body mass. Uh, what percent of your body mass can you move um, for multiple reps? I like to use that as an indicator. So if you can move your 100% of your body mass, say in a bench press for um, a certain number of repetitions, I know that you have enough strength endurance. Um, think of it as kind of like a benchmark. We can also use a squat to failure or a leg press to failure. Uh, a, a caveat here, if you can perform uh, more repetitions with 80% of your maximum. So say you test your 1RM, go back down to 80%. If you could perform more than about five or six repetitions, you're probably more of a slow twitch athlete. If you could perform uh, five or six or less repetitions after your 1RM test, you likely are more of a, a fast twitch athlete, less endurance capacity. Um, so that's another way to look at multiple um, pieces of your athlete's strength and strength endurance. Um, if you're using uh, maybe youth athletes, you're probably not going to put them under a bar. And if you don't have access to equipment, obviously you can't use them. Uh, so I like to use some other strength endurance assessments like the push up to failure, the pull ups to failure and the flexed arm hang as uh, more free uh, 
not, uh, easier to administer strength assessments. Um, especially the pull-ups to failure with my athletes, I like to be able to make sure that they can perform um, at least 12 repetitions of their pull-ups. That's kind of my benchmark. And for my advanced ones, um, three sets of 12 repetitions of pull-ups or underhand chin-ups uh, with three minutes rest between is kind of my benchmark for um, upper extremity pulling strength. If you don't have that, then you don't have the strength endurance likely or the postural endurance uh, to handle higher loads. Um, flex arm hang is often used in female athletes compared to male athletes um, until your athlete is able to perform pull-ups on their own. Um, plank to failure and the Sorensen back extension are great postural strength endurance assessments. Um, the Sorensen back extension, you're, you're strapped into a table um, or a glute ham raised machine. Um, so you're using your posterior chain, everything from your hamstrings, your glutes, uh, your erectors, your upper back muscles, your uh, posterior neck muscles to keep yourself at a um, straight alignment while gravity is trying to pull you down. Uh, if you can't hold the Sorensen back extension test for um, two minutes, we know that you likely have lower um, back and posterior chain strength endurance weakness. Um, and that may be something that you need to address and when it comes to postural stability, low back health, same with the side plank to failure, you should be able to hold a side plank for a minute and a half to two minutes. Um, a front plank at least two minutes um, with adequate uh, or with correct posture. Uh, so these are kind of benchmark assessments. Most of them don't cost any money. Um, <clears throat> they give you an indicator of where your athlete is on their strength endurance spectrum. Next, the more exciting test would be power assessment. So we have ones like the vertical jump and the standing long jump. Um, we can take different numbers from your vertical jump to understand um, if you're more reactive, if you're more um, conducive to producing force, or if you're better using or better at using your um, stretch shortening cycle. Um, we can look at the standing long jump. I like to use the standing long jump and the standing um, lateral long jump to understand my sagittal and lateral power of my athletes. Uh, because the vertical jump does require maybe some technology, um, these more horizontal and lateral measurements are a little bit more conducive to some more change of direction and rotational sports rather than the vertical jump, which is um, more conducive for vertical sport athletes like volleyball players, basketball players, and such. When it comes to upper body power assessments, I like to use med ball throwing assessments. So here's an example of the med ball put, uh, which is a forward or a chest pass, a sagittal plane movement, where we are trying to propel a specific weight medicine ball as far as possible. Uh, you can also do this from a seated position, from a standing position. Um, I also use medicine ball shot put um, so this is a rotational throw of the med ball, as well as a reverse throw. So a reverse throw would be um, facing backwards and doing kind of like a granny toss behind someone's head. Um, and they're throwing that ball as far as possible to get uh, more of a total body assessment for rotational and sagittal plane power rather than simply only upper extremity power, which we can see here. In the med ball put, it is strictly upper body power. Uh, if we look at speed, um, we can look at linear speed. A 10 yard sprint is likely going to tell you more about your athlete's acceleration abilities, while a 40 yard sprint will tell you more about their uh, maximum velocity capabilities with some of their acceleration components. Other sports, you may use something like a 60 yard sprint uh, for um, Baseball specifically, 60 yard sprint is the distance from home plate to first base and then first base to second base. Um, so they use a 60 yard sprint. Um, from this, you can measure your uh, flying 30. So you can take from 10 yards to 40 yards and understand how fast they can move. Um, so after that acceleration piece, look at how fast they're moving as well as their 40 to 20 um, to see their ability to maintain maximum velocity. So longer sprints can give you 
slightly more information about different components of your athlete's linear speed. If we're looking for change of direction ability, the pro agility is um, very specific to lateral changes of direction. So here we have a five yard sprint to the right, a 10 yard sprint to the left, and a five yard sprint to the right again. Um, so this tells us how well an athlete can stop and re-accelerate in an opposite direction. If we look at this together, it is a 20 yard sprint. So five plus 10 is 15, another five is 20. Um, and you can compare their 20 yard speed to their pro agility to understand how much they slow down when they have to change directions. Similarly, with the 505 agility, this is more specific to basketball. Um, you perform a 10 meter run in and then a into a flying five meter run, a stop and a return through five meters. So you have a 10 meter acceleration zone and then you have a five meter out turn and come back. Understanding how fast they perform this um, five meters turn five meters or 10 meter run and compare that to their flying 10 meter run. So their initial 10 meter run um, or one where they've already accelerated into it. You can understand how much your athletes are slowing down when they turn. If they have a very close 505 time to their 10 meter time, you know they're probably very good at changing direction. If it's a very big difference or large difference between their uh, maximal 10 meter sprint and their 505 sprint, uh, you know that you maybe need to spend more time on change of direction technique as well as the qualities that help an athlete change direction. Uh, T-test, um, Illinois agility test, three cone tests or all other um, change of direction ability tests. The Illinois agility test is much longer um, compared to the T-test or the three cone test, uh, but they all look at different ways the athlete has to change direction. When we look at mobility and, and flexibility, we know that Range of motion is joint specific. Uh, so we can use single joint goniometry. Um, I use this specifically with looking at um, shoulder rotation ability in baseball players um, to look at the single joint range of motion. Um, but you can also use ones like the overhead squat assessment or the ankle wall assessment as more field tests for um, general movement pattern ability. And these are all active range of motion tests as opposed to goniometry, which is more of a passive range of motion assessment. So how well your athlete can perform an overhead squat, looks at their um, scapular upper rotation, shoulder flexion, thoracic extension, uh, lumbopelvic stability, knee flexion and ankle dorsiflexion all together. Uh, the ankle wall assessment looks at strictly ankle dorsiflexion when it comes to um, a knee flexed position. So this is range of motion and flexibility of the soleus muscle and the posterior calf muscles, um, the smaller ones, and it looks at your ability to perform dorsiflexion in a closed chain position, very specific to what you would need in a squat, sprint, change of direction, things like that. Uh, when it comes to body composition, we can use BMI, but in athletic populations, BMI is often not ideal um, because it does not look at the percentage of adipose tissue. And oftentimes, if you have athletes with a lot of total body mass, especially a lot of lean mass, they may be considered overweight while they are completely healthy um, and have low percentage of body fat. So we could use skin fold calipers, which are relatively cheap. Um, you could use your waist to hip ratio or girth measurements to look at changes in size of the athlete's limbs, body. Um, these are good indicators. Waist to hip ratio is a good indicator for overall health. Girth measurements, especially if you're looking for hypertrophy in your athletes. Um, girth measurements of the locations where you're um, trying to develop hypertrophy um, are great ways. You can see how much size that athlete has gained within those areas of the body. Um, for body composition specifically, um, looking at percentage of lean mass to fat mass, hydrostatic weighing is still our gold standard, but we can also use bioelectrical impedance. It is getting less expensive 
to perform bioelectrical impedance measurements. Um, but they are affected greatly by your hydration status. So we, standardizing the protocol and the procedures is extremely important. Um, same with the DEXA. Uh, these are, uh, if you have access to it, I would recommend using it because it does look at bone mineral density also. Uh, but they are expensive machines. You have to be certified to use it. You, if you have access at maybe a university or a, um, a hospital, uh, it's an awesome measurement. Uh, at CSUB, we have the BOD pod, which uses air displacement plasmography. Uh, so we can assess body composition that way. Um, and the calculations are getting better and better. Um, so it is, it is pretty close to the gold standard. Um, and if you have access to it, I recommend you use it. Um, so we've looked at all of these different assessments. You can design your own as long as they're valid and reliable. Um, but how do we choose which ones to use? It all comes back to the needs analysis. So what do the athletes need? I don't want to test them on a quality that I don't need them to have. Okay? So what is necessary to be successful in the sport and which assessments fit those needs? So are my power assessments um, specific to the type of power the athlete needs as well as the plane of movement? Um, are my strength assessments indicative of what's necessary in the sport? My speed measurements indicative of how they have to maybe change directions or move within their sport um, and pick the correct ones. So why are we assessing in the first place? Remember, we need to assess our athletes to find their strengths and to find their weaknesses. We don't know just by looking at an athlete if they're strong in the right ways, if they can move well um, in the required positions um, at the required rates to be successful in their sport. Um, we also use it to evaluate our training programs to determine if we have successfully cause the adaptations that we plan to. Um, so this is how we can check and make sure that what we're doing is correct for our athletes. If we find that our training program did not improve in the qualities necessary for our athlete to excel in their sport, we have to go back into our training plan and change so that we can best improve our athletes in the way they need to improve. Okay, so assessments give us objective data Okay, so there's no opinion involved. We've measured this um, objectively. So we are able to make educated decisions on how to progress or regress our athletes to help them to improve within their sport. Um, so it is necessary that you test. If you don't test, you don't know. And if you're going to pre-test, you must post-test in order to determine if what you're doing is right for your athletes. All right, here are your review questions. And I'll see you in our next class meeting.